We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. Things can go wrong in seconds. When you're out in the boat, every minute counts. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people, ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When the pager goes off, your body's full of adrenaline. OK, guys, go, go, go. There's potentially a family out there with somebody missing. If it hadn't been for them, I, I wouldn't be here today. We'll get you out of here. They definitely saved my life. Yep. Equipped with their own cameras, the crews give us a unique insight into every call-out hey, as only they see it. You're doing really, really well, buddy. Guys, we need to get him in. Get him in, get him in. For those who risk their lives, it has become a way of life. Come on! To know that you've helped save a life. Let's get you in! It's such an awesome feeling. Oh, oh! On the east coast of Scotland, lying in the shadow of the world-famous Forth Bridge, is the small town of Queensferry. Whenever I'm explaining to someone where I live, I say, you know the big red bridge? That's where I live. You see so many tourists coming from, you know, everywhere in the world. You hear all sorts of languages, and they're all coming to see it. We're only 15 minutes from the city centre of Edinburgh, but it feels as though we're out in a little, you know, east coast fishing village. There's been a lifeboat station here since 1967, with the current boat being an Atlantic 85, one of the fastest in the fleet in order to deal with the powerful tidal currents here. We've got some of the strongest tides on the east coast of Scotland. The tide and the wind combined can really, really quickly make the seas, you know, quite dangerous. It is easy for people to get cut off by the tide. So yeah, I'd say that's probably one of the main dangers. The fourth estuary is also home to several islands, one of which is responsible for almost half of Queen's Ferry's shouts. Cramond Island is somewhere that is a really nice place to go and visit and go and check out all the World War II relics and the old gun emplacements. It's connected to the shore via causeway with big teeth that stick up. And it was used in the First and Second World War um, to defend Scotland from attack. So at low tide, you can walk out to the island no problem at all. At high tide, it's completely cut off with a few metres of water all around it. So at the station, we sometimes refer to cramming the clock. If it's a nice sunny day and a fast rising tide, you're sometimes just waiting for the pagers to go off. Early August, late afternoon, a call comes in from a bystander who's spotted someone in the water on the Crammond Causeway. Any time that we get told that, you know, on, someone's in the water on the Causeway of Crammond Island, it's, it's, yeah, the urgency goes up. Somebody in the water, that's the highest level of danger that we can ever have. So straight away, you're like, we need to get going and we need to get there quick. Called for help. It's a quick rising tide. With the speed of the tides that we have, there's a real risk that people can be swept off the causeway. That's generally not going to end in a nice outcome. There's a life at risk, so there's a lot more urgency. We'll go with three. Ideally, we would go with four people on the boat but I made the decision to go with three because we had to get there as quickly as possible. Nine minutes after the pages sounded, the lifeboat launches and heads to Crammond Island, four miles downriver of the lifeboat station. So as we were launching, I heard that Kinghorn Lifeboat, they're our flank station, were also attending. Kinghorn speeds to Crammond Island from the east, while Queen's Ferry approaches from the west. In a race against time to reach the causeway before the rising tide sweeps the casualty away. 
When we launched, because the conditions were so good, we were able to go at full speed. Water temperatures in the fourth drop as low as 13 degrees, even in August. So a person in the water can rapidly become hypothermic. But even at their top speed of 35 knots, it still takes the Queen's Ferry crew a full seven minutes to reach the causeway. As we came around the corner, we could see the concrete pillars that mark the causeway, and the water was really far up them. Uh, can you put us on scene and say we're trying to find the casualty? We had been told that the casualty was a third of their way along the pillars, so we knew that we would have to go quite far into the shore. When you're looking for someone in the water, it can be difficult to see someone. A lot of the time, they're not wearing a helmet, they're not wearing an inflatable. It's, it's very much, it's just them. It's even harder on the causeway because you've got lots of big concrete pillars that are also dark. It's a mile that you need to search. We're scanning the whole causeway, but you're having to also scan around the water as well in case that they, you know, drifted. Until you see that casualty, you've got a real feeling of apprehension and worry that the worst might have happened. Sadly, it can end up that you don't find them in the end, which is, yeah, it's devastating, really. With Kinghorn still a few minutes away, the Queen's Ferry crew search for any sign of the casualty, unsure how long he's been in the water. But then, just as they start fearing the worst... So as we were searching, Petra spotted something out to the right, way far away from where we thought the casualty was going to be. So in the distance, we saw what looked to be somebody holding on to one of the partially fallen pillars. Um, I wasn't sure myself, uh, but as we got closer, it became clear that that was the casualty. They were very much just kind of draped, draped over it, clinging on for dear life, really. And the water was kind of rising, like, right up almost to their mouth. And we could just hear the casualty calling out and just groaning. Stay where you are just now, mate. Just keep holding on. We could hear him moaning, which is great in one thing, because you know he's still alive, but then also suggests that he's not in a great way. Uh. It was a really quick feeling of relief, but then straight into the next sort of set of emotions as you start to think about, right, well, how do we get this person off of there safely? As the casualty is clinging to a concrete pillar on the east side of the submerged causeway, getting close to him will be risky. There's not a lot of water over the causeway, and there is a danger to our engines. If we'd rushed in, we risk damaging our boat, and we can't rescue anybody if we ourselves need to be rescued. Fortunately, just as Stuart is weighing up his options, he spots the Kinghorn lifeboat on the horizon, approaching at full speed. Kinghorn lifeboat, this is Queensferry lifeboat, over. Uh, we're just off where the casualty is just now. I think it's going to be easier for you to get them because uh, we've got the walkway in between us and the stanchions over. As the Kinghorn lifeboat is still on its way, the Queen's Ferry crew continue to reassure the casualty that help is imminent. The other lifeboat's coming in to get you. Can you just keep holding on? They're just coming in. I was really aware that I didn't want them to relax and let go and try and swim across to us. Because I knew if they did that, they wouldn't have the strength and, you know, there could be a not very nice outcome. You're OK, mate. You're doing grand. Here they are just now. With the ambulance only a couple of minutes away on shore, the Kinghorn lifeboat arrives and moves in towards the casualty. When we got close to him, uh, he, the casualty was uh, making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. Are we just going for a straight left? Yeah. But he didn't seem particularly lucid and it was suspected it may have been hypothermia. Hypothermia causes confusion and uh, people's bodies begin to shut down. So I directed a couple of crew members to get hold of him and uh, pull him in as quickly as possible. 
Sometimes when we go out to save someone, as you're kind of pulling them in, they're helping themselves. But the casualty on this occasion, it was genuinely, it was almost like he was lifeless. When we brought him in, uh, the casualty it was very cold and wasn't making any very much sense. He was whining and uh, howling and generally seemed in pretty poor condition. If ambulance is assigned the highest priority, should be with the shop. It was our next priority to get him into the care of Scottish Ambulance Service so that they could look after him and make sure that he'd be OK. Both lifeboats head to nearby Cramon Village to rendezvous with an inbound ambulance. As we got alongside, we tied up our boat and I walked down to see if we could assist. Oh, yeah. So as I got to Kinghorn Lifeboat, they, getting on. they updated me on the casualties condition. He did have injuries to his hands and his feet and his body. Right, three, two, one, lift. Ah! His hands and his feet were all cut to shreds. His torso was covered in cuts from the barnacles and rocks that he'd been holding on to. And yeah, I think at that point I realised how close this guy was to not having a good outcome. <laughs> The casualty, he wasn't able to have a conversation. I mean, he was responsive, but that was about it. He wasn't, he wasn't alert enough to be able to answer simple questions and that kind of thing. Think on top of the cuts and scrapes and bruises and things that he'd had. We were really worried at that point that he had taken on water or that he was suffering from hypothermia. Right, one, two, three, left. Straight on. There you go. Perfect. Great job. Oh, the ambulance personnel were able to, to measure the casualties temperature and anything under 35 degrees would be considered hypothermic. They came back to see that their meter only worked down to 33 degrees and thereafter it just had down arrows and this casualties temperature uh, only had down arrows on it. Cheers. Cheers, guys. The casualty is immediately rushed to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary to be treated for cuts, secondary drowning, and extreme hypothermia. I remember an ambulance and an oxygen mask being put on, and I, my clothes being torn. I, I, I don't recall much then. Danny had been on a long-planned pilgrimage to Scotland to trace his family's history. When a woman on his campsite told him about Cramond Island and its World War II fortress, he knew he had to visit. When she had mentioned fortress, I'm very interested in fortresses, castles. The next day, I went out there. I hadn't seen any signs at all warning me of the high tide, low tide change. And I, I assumed that my timing was OK walking out there. But once I got interested in the island itself, it, I don't know, it took me maybe an hour or two to go around. And within that time frame, the tide had come in. And the walkway, the causeway, is, had vanished. It, it, it was gone. I looked to the beach, and at the end of the causeway, I figured I can swim this. I know I can swim this, no problem. I used the pillars as a guide, knowing that the walkway was right next to it. I really wasn't aware of the cold that time. I knew I just had to move and keep on moving. But each meter or two, it just kept on pulling me under, and I was swollen water at every gasp, every stroke. Swim a little bit, grab a pillar, swim a little bit more, grab another pillar. And that, I thought, was working out until I just lost completely all my, my strength. I completely went under. This was the point where I, I personally, I, I actually gave up and I was underwater. And I, I actually was taught, praying to my mother and father, I'm, I'm coming now. I felt, well, I'm, 
I'm hoping I'm coming to join you, I guess. I, I Never in my life. Never in my life have I felt that way. I felt my body just go into a limp. I, I just, I felt it at that point, but that one last last breath or struggle what came about and there was a pillar in front of me there and I just clung on to that with my whatever I had left in me. Danny managed to haul himself up the broken pillar and clung to it as the current continued to tug at him. I was out of the water and I had at least something to hold on to that was keep me afloat and once I started catching my breath, semi out of the water, that's when I started hollering for help. His cries managed to catch the attention of a passerby who saw him in the water and called the Coast Guard. It was really good that somebody spotted the casualty and called 999. Uh, without that person, you know, we might not have known that somebody had been caught out on the causeway. They saved my life. If it hadn't been for them, I, I wouldn't be here today, I believe. If we were minutes later, if we, if we hadn't been called, it could have been a really different outcome. Danny spent a day and a half in hospital being treated for his lacerations and the after effects of severe hypothermia. I've been close to death a few times and this was the closest I've come to it. Those people were absolutely amazing there. The rescuers and those people, the hospital will always be in my heart. Though the crews of the RNLI know all too well how perilous the water can be, to many seaside visitors, by the time the dangers become apparent, they already need rescue. Come on, Eddie. You're okay. A lot of people get caught out in the summer months, especially when the offshore breeze um, freshens in the afternoon and will push people out to sea on um, paddle boards and kayaks and stuff. OK. Well done, mate. Come and hold on to me. Quite often when our families come down, it's never necessarily been that near the sea. In this split instance, just what was a nice leisurely day at the beach just there and turned to disaster. Sorry. No, don't, don't apologise. It's OK. If you're swimming, paddleboarding, sailing, experienced sailor, um, anyone can get caught out by, by Mother Nature. It's just what it does. First place jacket on, we'll keep you off, yeah? Anybody can get caught out at sea. You don't know what equipment might fail on you. Also, you just don't know where you might end up, you know, or what might happen to you. Get my friends in. OK. All right. If you think you're immune to getting caught out at sea, you will be the first one to get caught out at sea. Whoa. And if you're not prepared for that, you will come unstuck. Lying on the Cornish coast at the most southerly point of the British mainland is the Lizard Peninsula. We've got the best of, of both worlds here at the Lizard. Steep cliffs, small beaches. As you start going up the eastern side of the Lizard, um, it all starts to become much more gentle. Lovely tidal river, little woody creeks, Daphne de Maurier country. It is lovely, it's gorgeous. I think we are quite a hot spot down in the Lizard at least in the summer holidays, because we get all the visitors coming, and they always come unprepared. A lot of these people are actually coming from places where they don't experience the sea. They get into the sea, and, and they can get into difficult sea. But that's why we're here, isn't it? There's been a lifeboat station here since 1859, with several stations at three different locations. The current one is nestled in the cliffs at Kilcobbin Cove, a mile east of Lizard Village. Boathouse sits at the bottom of a cliff. It's got around 170 steps down to the station. Uh, fortunately, we have a lift. The boat we have here at the station is a Tamar class lifeboat. It's an all-weather lifeboat. 
during the winter months we get a lot more fishing boats uh, either broken down or injured persons on board. In the summer months we have people cut off by the tide, people that are stranded on the cliffs. There is a history of, of shipwrecks around the Lizard. Sailing ships back in the day were going to be very vulnerable to a change in weather conditions. It wouldn't take much to get blown onto a rocky shore. Peter, a crew member on the Lizard lifeboat for over 40 years, is the oracle on local wrecks, including the one that holds the record for the biggest rescue in RNLI history. It took place here over 100 years ago, when the passenger liner SS Suvik ran aground. She had a total uh, number of, of people on board of 456. There was 132 crew, uh, and the rest were, were, were passengers. And unusually, um, for, for a ship of, of that size, there were, there were a lot of women and young children aboard. On the night of the 17th of March, 1907, the Suvik was on the approach to Plymouth when strong winds and thick fog caused her to strike the Menia Reef, a belt of half-submerged rocks a few hundred metres off Lizard Point. Just there, where you can see the, the, the sea breaking over, is where she actually hit. It was there, so you can see how close it was, in fact, to the, uh, to the lifeboat station. The lifeboat at the time was a, a rowing boat called the Admiral Sir George Back. Now, she had 10 oars and 13 crew. She was launched from the beach, completely open to the elements, completely different brand of men than in later generations. Hats off to them. I mean, rowing boats, cork vests and small skins when they go out in, in seas. I mean, that's, that's bravery, isn't it? Initially, the weather was good enough for them to bring the casualties back to here. But as the night wore on, the, the, uh, the wind got much worse. And so they couldn't land them here. So they had to take them all the way around to Cadsworth, which I know isn't very far, but you try rowing to Cadsworth in a half, a half a gale. Over 16 hours, the crew of the Lizard boat, along with three other local lifeboats, rowed the ship's passengers and crew back to shore with not a single life lost. The Suvik uh, still stands today as uh, the largest rescue in Iron Light history. It was an outstanding rescue. It must have been a massive undertaking. It would be a massive undertaking today, to be honest. And uh, for them to rescue 456 lives, it's amazing. It truly is. We're very proud of the Lizard to be part of that history. And the same rocks that nearly finished off the Suvik still cause problems to this day. Early May, tide on the rise. Tuesday evening training session at the lifeboat station. We were just about to launch on an exercise, routine exercise, just about to let go, and the pages went off. A call has come into the Coast Guard reporting four people cut off by the rising tide on Pig Rock part of the same reef the Suvik struck, within sight of the old lifeboat station. If somebody's cut out by the tide, I think it's quite urgent because uh, the situation is changing very rapidly. My initial thoughts were with the rising tide, that it wouldn't be long uh, before they'd be submerged and they would be in the water. Yeah, the, the water is, is cold. It's cooled down over the whole of the winter not had the sun on it. It's absolutely freezing. You're not going to last too long in a, in a cold sea. As both lifeboat and crew are already prepped for the training session, they launch within minutes and head to location around the headland. Pig rock from the station is very close, really. It's what, about five minutes maximum by, by sea. Initially, the sea conditions were quite good. But as, as, as we went around the corner, we could see there was a fair bit of uh, ground swell uh, rolling in. As we were rounding the point, uh, had eyes on the casualties. The four casualties are stranded on a group of rocks. 
accessible at low tide, but cut off again when the tide returns. They were in T-shirts and shorts and flip-flops. So it's just basically summer clothing. They looked really, really worried. They were certainly in a less than ideal location. I, I remember thinking, this is going to be interesting. Though the casualties are surrounded by water, it is too shallow for the all-weather boat to approach safely. So I gave the order to prepare the Y boat. The Y boat is a small inflatable dinghy that can get in closer to the rocks than the Tamar. So the plan was me and Ed, um, yeah, jump in the Y boat so that we can assess the situation. <laughs> and then hopefully pop in and get them off. It got it started and we went round to the right of the line of rocks to the point to get in. As the Y boat is just three metres long and already has two crew members on board, rescuing four casualties is going to be a challenge. Just keep a really good eye for rocks. Yeah. Okay, like With that. the sun dipping lower and the light fading, the crew decide the best option is to rescue them two at a time. I was at the front calling out to Ed if I saw anything that we were going to hit. Yeah, it's a rock underneath us. There's loads of submerged rocks and sharp reefs. Going over a rock. You could hit a rock and damage the propeller, and uh, then you could potentially be smashed against the rocks. The rocky bottom, we've got plenty of room. Oh, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't want to hit one in the in the Y boat. Um, obviously, you could tear the fabric, and if you put a hole in it, it's going to sink like, like any boat. We'll head you up to it, and our nose on, hold the power. We just literally, one at a time, just grab them. Yeah, OK. The initial plan was to try and quickly recover the two that were in the more um, dangerous of the two positions at the time. Yeah, there you are, guys. It's only when we got in and fairly up close to them that you could see that there was a fair bit of white water around where it's breaking over the rocks. They need for their feet. It's like breaking around their legs, so they needed to be got off. It would have only taken one set of swell to come through, knock, knock them off their feet, and then in the water they go. Well, one of you, what's this one, you? Come on, quickly, get up. Come on. quite a noisy situation with the sea breaking on the rocks. I think I shouted because I wanted to get the urgency across that they had to do what I wanted them to do, and I had, they had to do it quite quickly. Yeah, both uh, safe and well, one male, one female. Uh, so they, were, they were both pleased to be aboard. Not quite sure they appreciated the severity of the situation that they, that they found themselves in. So what we're going to do is probably put you on the big lifeboat for a minute. Right. Are they your friends? Yeah, OK. There was no life jackets, there was no cold water clothing. If they'd gone in the sea, they would have, yeah, been in trouble. Three, two, one, and go. Ed and Phil transfer the first two casualties to the all-weather boat. OK, push away. Then head back to the reef looking for the safest route in to rescue their two friends. OK, Phil. That's the easy one, though. I remember saying to Phil, after we'd taken the first two to the lifeboat, saying, well, that was the easy one. Yeah, still not in a very good spot. Uh... Though the second group of casualties are in a higher position on the reef, it's actually much harder and more dangerous for the Y boat to get close to them. Yes, we tried a different approach for the second two because um, because of, of where they were on the rocks. Yes, we'll have a look this side. What we may do is tuck ourselves in. So we went round to the left of the point, see if we could come into it from that way, um, see if it make it a bit easier. Hey guys, stay where you are! But it became apparent as we got up to where they were that there were just too many, too many rocks between us and them. Hang on, Luke. See that? There's a ledge all the way round them, mate. Can you see? A whole ledge of submerged rock in front of where, so there was no way that we could get to them from that side. With the tide still rising, waves are now breaking over the casualties and threatening to wash them off the rapidly submerging rock. Jesus Christ. I think the other side, mate, to be honest. Ed decides to pull back and 
attempt an approach from the other side. By this time, the sea had picked up and there was a, a bit more white water on the rocks and it was a, more turbulent and more violent. Stay there. We go other side. Because I remember thinking, oh, how are we going to do this? The swell was coming from three different, three different directions by that point and rebounding off the cliff wall very close to us. Still OK out here. Creating quite a confused sea state. And one minute there was water, the next minute there wasn't. A bit like what we call the bathtub effect. It, it did look more sketchy. Yeah, I mean, the, the water was just more turbulent, making it obviously more difficult for us to get close to the rocks. getting to the point where I was thinking it it might not be possible to get them in the Y boat. Yeah, that's about the far as you can get, mate, I reckon. As the churning waves threaten to wash the casualties off their rapidly dwindling island, Ed and Phil are running out of time. I did remember saying to Phil, if we're gonna do this, we're only going in there once. And if and they're both coming. But there was a, a, a some sort of low in a set coming in, whatever it was, um, and he just he just went for it. Just one of you, come on, come on! Thank you, thank you. So, come on, come on! Yeah. Watch it, there's a boy in the water. Isn't it? Because of the urgency of the situation, um, they were literally sort of just hauled into the boat, and the Y boat isn't very big. So, yeah, it was all a bit of a squash and a squeeze. See the bottom of the boat, mate? Don't want you falling out now. As soon as they were both on board, we managed to manoeuvre out of there, back into a bit of safer water, and then retraced our steps back round to the lifeboat. The two casualties joined their friends on the all weather boat to be checked for injuries prior to heading back to shore. A dramatic end to their afternoon's fishing. When they came on board, they looked really frightened. They could have gone one or two ways. That was not easy. No, it wasn't, was it? I don't think anyone needed any further medical attention. Probably just probably a cup of tea. <laughs> Once we dropped them off back at the station, we uh, then went to continue with um, with our uh, weekly exercise. I don't think they quite appreciated what a dangerous situation they were in. If they hadn't been spotted and they didn't have the means to call for help, um, well, they'd have been washed off the rocks. And then, like I say, they didn't have life jackets. They didn't have appropriate clothing for the for the sea you know, for the sea temperature. Yeah, I mean, it could have gone all horribly wrong. At the end of the day, we've gone out there and we've helped some people, complete strangers, got themselves into trouble at sea, so I think we were all chuffed. Yeah. You know, when you can actually do that and you put some of your training in practice, you know, yeah, it's quite a nice feeling. Hundred and fifty miles east, on the southern bank of the Severn estuary, is the historic port town of Portishead. So Portishead has um, infamously been called the Miami of the Southwest. It's a great little town. We're ten minutes away from Bristol city centre, um, but we feel like we're a holiday resort. Um, if you walk around Marine on a sunny day, you could be in the Mediterranean. The biggest attraction in, in Portishead is the marina. Lots of shops, lots of lots of bars, lots of restaurants. Portishead Marina is the closest marina to the centre of the country, really. So you get um, a lot of people from landlocked Middle England who want to keep the boat um, somewhere close by, and Portishead is the obvious choice for that. There's been an RNLI station here since 2015, keeping an eye on these sailors and all the local dangers. So the area around Portishead is, um, is very varied. Um, we have some steep cliffs up to sort of 50 feet. Uh, we have shingle beaches. We have mud banks that are exposed at low tide. We have a massive tidal range, um, second highest in the world. 
we can have a, a range of, of 14 to, to 15 meters on a big spring and um, that sheer amount of water moving in and out can be really, really treacherous. In certain cases, I mean, most yachts can sail or even use their engines against the flow. It's that faster current. The shouts in Porter's Head can, can never be described as predictable. Um, you know, there's, there's so much going on on the water at any one time, you're never really sure what, you can, what, what you're going to. Early August, 9 p.m. Low tide, but on the rise. When the pager goes off, we have no idea what's, what's about to unfold. We were told that it was a person in the water. The only information we had was that they were um, either swimming in the water or holding onto a buoy, and they were screaming for help. That was the only information we got. The person in the water is a potentially very life-threatening situation. Things can go downhill very, very quickly if someone is in the water, so we need to get our boat on the water and get on our way to saving that casualty if at all possible. In the room. 20 minutes after the call came in, the lifeboat launches and heads towards the casualty's last reported position. So the location was in Kilkenny Bay, um, which is just round Battery Point, approximately a mile and a half from the lifeboat station. Once we've launched, we start heading around the corner. It's getting darker all the time. When you've got somebody in the water and the light is fading badly, then you are very, very aware that you've got to be uh, bringing your best game to be able to find them. We've had a number of searches for people in the water over the years, and some are successful, and oftentimes they're not successful. And all of this was going through my head as we came around the corner is, yeah, I hope we find him quickly because this could, this has the potential to be horrendous. No, we in Coast Guard, or said like that. Yeah, we're on the scene. It takes the crew just two minutes to reach location by which time the sun has dipped below the horizon. When we came around the um, headland, uh, Portishead Point, um, we saw very quickly that there was a um, big motor cruiser at anchor um, with lots of people on the back. We start heading towards that, and then very quickly, we see that, the, um, that there's a paddleboard with um, two casualties on board this paddleboard. Um, a distance away from the, the motor vessel. We'll come to you, all right? So when we actually approached, we noticed that neither of them were wearing life jackets. Uh, the gentleman was just wearing his swim trunks. Uh, need any medical assistance? Right no, 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 it's fine. We came alongside and we quickly asked if they were OK. We come off, I come off the boat and then I was trying to swim back to it and the tide was so strong. Yeah. Then she came out to pick me up on this. Can you come this way? Can you get Can you? There you go. There you go. In we come, nice and gentle. There we go. Get you in first, OK? Oh, cheers, mate. Thanks, right, buddy. When I was on the lifeboat, I felt relieved to, to be, you know, safe and, you know, dry uh, and, and not... I didn't feel in danger anymore. I felt, yeah, felt a great sense of relief. It was mental. The boat was... I dived in and the boat was just there. I was trying to swim back and... Uh, and that was the end of that? Oh, mad. Adam was on a trip down from London with his girlfriend when their friend suggested an evening afloat. The plan was to, to go out and to anchor up just off the shore, um, go for a swim, um, have a barbecue on the boat and enjoy the weather. The weather was really nice that day. We left the uh, Portishead Marina, we anchored up, the sun was just setting. I said to my girlfriend, I said, I'm, I feel like I should jump, have it jump in the sea before, uh, before the sun goes down. There's a video of me jumping off the side of the boat, which was taken by Laura, my, my girlfriend's twin sister. <laughs> the thing I was worried about the most was jumping into the cold water, to be honest. When I re-emerged, and, and saw that the boat was 10 feet away. 
I started to try and swim back and I was swimming as, as hard as I could. And the people on the boat, my girlfriend said to me, like, just swim back. She said, just swim back. Said, what are you doing? Just swim back. And, and, and I said to them, I'm swimming as hard as I can. Oh, and I was making no ground at all. And it was at that point I realised that if I carry on swimming, I'm going to be in trouble because I, I, was, I was running out of energy. The tide was running so fast. Um, so I said to them, I've, I've got to stop. I can't, there's no way I'm going to make it back to the boat. Realising he was struggling, Adam's girlfriend's sister, Laura, jumped on the paddleboard and headed over to help. The paddleboard's quite big and I thought, I'll stick him on the back and come back in. Until Adam got onto the back of the paddleboard, I had no idea how strong it was. And then when he got on and I started to paddle, I was like, oh, wow, this is why he was struggling. I hadn't realised how strong it was until that point. I was trying to paddle um, and we just weren't getting anywhere. I just started to get very tired very quickly. And that, that's, when it, that's when it became apparent just how much danger we were in, to be honest. Although the boat finally managed to move within 20 feet of Adam and Laura, the water was too shallow for it to get any closer, leaving the two of them adrift for over an hour. The safety of the boat was just getting further and further away. Yeah, when we was making no headway, the tide was just taking us further out. Yeah, it was it was scary, yeah. Adam was getting colder, uh, I was getting cold, um, and I thought, if we're out here and it's dark, we're going to be much harder to find. Um, so I was getting more worried at that point, yeah, definitely. The other concern was I, I'm a type 1 diabetic, so I was worried that my, my blood sugar level was potentially going low and I didn't have any sugar. I was worried at that point that we were exhausted, you know, that there's no way that we could have done anything else. What Adam and Laura didn't know was that even though the boat couldn't get close enough to rescue them, their friends had called the Coast Guard. Then we saw the lifeboat come round the, round the corner of the, uh, of the coast and it was, it was relief, to be honest, you know. It was, uh, yeah, it was really, it was, it was a real, it was a real good feeling to to know that that, that they were gonna to come and rescue us. When the boat finally got to us, um, I think straight away we were like, oh, thank God, we're safe. That's okay. As both casualties were in good health, the lifeboat took them back to their friends on the nearby boat. The strength of the tide that was flooding past the motor vessel was was not to be <laughs> underestimated. Oi, okay. It was really hard for me to hold on to that, that boat. Um, so this was this was what the casualty had had to contend with um, and why the situation could have been a lot more serious. Give it your hand. There we go. Hold that hand. There we go. Yep. Sorry to drag you out, guys. That's all right. Got me out the last of the gardening. You're OK. If we hadn't been able to get eyes on the casualties as quickly as we had, um, and the paddleboard hadn't been launched, it could have been a, a, a horrendous evening. Porter said lifeboat returning back to the station. Porter said lifeboat out. Cool. Okay, I, I, was, I was so grateful for, for Laura coming to, to get me because I, you know, I was, I was out in, in the middle of the sea on my own, getting taken further and further away from the boat. She most certainly saved my life. And she was my absolute saviour, yeah. On the southwest tip of England, lying at the mouth of the river that shares its name, is the harbour town of Foy. Foy's a nice little, they say it's a little town, but it's quite a big town. I think we have a population of about 3,000 here in the summer months, so you can easily double that. Um, it is quite a touristy town. Got a lovely river as well. Got nice little beaches. The town itself, lovely, narrow streets, old houses. It, it's a lovely place. Tucked away down one of these narrow streets and facing out onto the estuary is the current Foy lifeboat station. We've had lifeboat station in Foy uh, for over 150 years now. 
We've had a few stations in for a four-wheel lifeboat. Um, one was down at Pole Carriers. The old station is still actually there. It's converted to a restaurant now, which um, one of our ex-crew actually runs. While the old lifeboat station now serves the local catch to tourists, the current one still serves the local community. We have a Trent class lifeboat and a D class lifeboat here. The Trent, very good boat. It was like a Rolls Royce when it turned up. Modern, seats, heating. What more could you want from a lifeboat? We get a very mixed variety of shouts around here. You get the occasional yacht that will end up tangled up in a pot boy or engine broke down and they've run out of wind. Sailing's very popular down here. You've got a lot of sailing boats that regularly race in the harbour, and then you've got a lot of people that are transiting through to head down to the Silly Isles, that stop off and stay for a day or two before they go on to their next port. It's very hard to tell what you're going to see for until you get here and find out what's happening. Late Tuesday morning, end of March. Four six winds are battering the coastline. A yacht is spotted near the old lifeboat station at Pol Keris, with no sail, no mast, and no sign of anyone on board. A clip of it has been sent to the Foy lifeboat station. Concerns I had when I saw the video was the fact of it's very shallow in that area. There's a couple of rocks, and it's a very sandy bottom. So unless you've got a lot of anchor cable out, uh, there is possibility of dragging. And then the uh, page went off. The crew assemble and get kitted up, ready to launch as quickly as possible. My big concern was there's a good possibility he would be going aground at the low tide. As well as the risk of the yacht hitting rocks, there is another bigger concern. We got told that there was somebody on board with a head injury. And then you've got more of a sense of urgency because you don't know what condition the person's in. You could just have a little cut. You could have a big gash. So we need to make best speed to this casualty and assess him once we're there. The crew launch quickly and start heading the five miles west around Gribbon Head to Paul Keris, where the yacht is in trouble. We had a good couple of metre swells there running through. We were airborne a few times, but we were also slowing down on the waves. The Trent rolls quite a bit, so one minute you're on a sort of 30 degree angle one way and a 30 degree angle the other way. As the crew make their way to location, they attempt to contact the yacht skipper, but get no response. When you don't hear anything back, you are thinking, right, what's going on? What are we going to find when we get there? Obviously, with head injuries, you can lose consciousness. Um, if there's no communications coming through from the casualty, you, you get a lot of adrenaline coming through then. You want to get to them as soon as possible. But with 20 mile an hour winds and large swells slowing them down, it takes the lifeboat almost 15 minutes to reach location. first glimpse of the yacht once we got on the scene was, well, it was like a cork bobbing round in amongst the waves, to be honest with you, very close to the shoreline. He wasn't a local chap, so he didn't have the local knowledge. You, you look at the position he's in, you wouldn't anchor in there, not in the conditions. With the yacht in shallow water and just metres from running aground, the lifeboat edges closer and the skipper finally makes contact over the radio. They managed to get some VHF comms over Channel 16 with the occupant, who then stated that uh, he had received a head injury um, the previous night and was uh, not, not in the best of conditions due to the fact of fatigue more than anything else. He was happy in his wheelhouse. So we told him to stay in there. He was up and down two to three metres at a time. With an anchor up, I was putting a huge amount of tension on that anchor line. 
He was only three metres offshore with a breaking sea behind us. Each time that's pushing us closer to the shore as well. So we have to prioritise what's the best way to get that casualty out of danger. Though the water is too shallow for the lifeboat to come alongside, the yacht's anchor line extends into deeper water. The crew decide to grab it with a grappling hook to try and tow the yacht out of danger. Me and Graham went up on the bow. Graham had the grappling hook to throw it at his anchor line on the casualty vessel. We grappled the chap's anchor, but as we started going backwards, the grappling hook rode up the anchor line, got to the bow of his boat, found a sharp point, and unfortunately, that's the point where his anchor line snapped. And it was, oh no, hang on, we've got to get a line on there quick. With the anchor line broken, the yacht starts drifting quickly back to shore. So Graham grabs another rope, ready to tie it onto the yacht. Once we were going towards the vessel, put that extra line on. With the sea conditions, it then turns from a bow facing the sea. It then puts his beam facing to the sea. But Jonathan's got to maneuver our boat next to his. I was holding Graham, so he was leaning towards the rail. Anything working on the foredeck is dangerous, but leaning over with a possibility of a casualty vessel moving very differently to what your vessel is. Graham could have got injured. Boris had my back that day, had hold of my life jacket, a very firm grip. Yeah, it was lean over, get the rope round the capstan, the strongest point on the bow of the boat. Once we had the rope tied off on the bow of the lifeboat, yeah, you've got control of the yacht again you can start getting out of the danger that it's in and then focus on dealing with the casualty on board. The plan is to tow the yacht away from shore, then get a crew member on board in calmer water. And weather conditions, unfortunately, were increasing at the time. We couldn't find anything that was suitable. The main concern with the boat where it was, was the fact that we had a person on board that boat that had a head injury, and you want to give them the medical treatment they need or pass them on to further care as soon as possible. I need the casualty off the vessel, but we can't actually physically get to him without putting him back in danger. So a Coast Guard helicopter was requested. On the Coast Guard helicopter, there's trained paramedics. They're the best people to have on a situation like that. The helicopter scrambles from Newquay, and for the next 20 minutes, the lifeboat continues to tow the yacht, keeping it pointed into the waves until the helicopter arrives. So once the helicopter came on scene, they do a little recce. What's their best situation? 90% of the time, the helicopter likes to operate from the lifeboat if um, we're transferring a casualty. But as the conditions are still too rough to transfer the casualty to the lifeboat, the winch paramedic will have to land on the yacht instead. Landing on a yacht with no person on the deck, with rigging down everywhere, is sort of a lot more precarious for them to do. You've got a chap hanging on a wire, the helicopter pilot's trying to keep the same height all the time, Try, trying to estimate their, the pitch of the vessel of him to land on there safely is a very difficult job for them. One of the gentlest of the landings, but it was, uh, he, he was OK. He scuttled back to the uh, cockpit to see the persons on board then. The first time we seen the casualty was when he came out of the wheelhouse with a the winchman. They strapped straight on, and in a couple of seconds, they were out the boat in the air. From that point, once that casualty was off the vessel, I managed to slow down a bit then. Think, right, OK, now we can deal with the yacht on its own. The casualty is flown to the Royal Cornwall Hospital. 
while the crew tow his yacht back to Foy Harbour. I think the chap was very lucky. If he'd have sat there much longer, then it could have been a completely different outcome for him. Ultimately, that chap wouldn't have a boat no more, and I hate to say it, possibly not a life anymore either. It does feel like you've got that sense of a job well done come the end of it. You know that as a, as a team, you've been out there and ultimately saved a life. After their near-death experience at Portishead, Adam and Laura have had time to reflect on the events of that evening. Looking back, um, yeah, it was it was uh, it was very foolish of me of me to jump in off the side of the boat. I didn't realise at the time how fast the the current was running. When you look back at the video of Adam jumping in, you can see how quickly the water's moving. Definitely lucky that we were OK in the end, because I think it could have been much worse. It's made me so much more appreciative of, um, of how dangerous the sea can be. It's given me so much respect for the, for the RNLI um, who, who risk their lives to, to come and save me after, you know, an act of foolishness, really, jumping off the side of the boat. Danny is still recovering, both mentally and physically, from his trip to Scotland that so nearly ended in tragedy. I haven't swum in the ocean since. I went from Scotland to Rhodes Island, Greece, and the water there was amazingly beautiful, turquoise blue, but I didn't go in the water one time. I still had the trauma in me. I was felt blessed to be walking the earth again and happy to be around, but I was told it would take months before I get the full feelings on my fingers again and feet. It's traumatic. It's a, something, uh, an experience I'll never, ever forget in my life. Nor the rescuers. The rescuers are my, my angels. I, uh, at that point, I, 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 like I said, I was given up. You've given me a new life, a new understanding of how dangerous the tides can be and how dangerous that walkway and causeway can be. My most, utmost gratitude and appreciation, I think I'm, I'm pretty much blessed. When there's someone in the water, it becomes very urgent. You're all right. I think it was probably only a few seconds between life or death. In conditions like that, going upside of a vessel, it's always going to be dangerous. Right, let's go. It's daunting when somebody's life's in your hands. There's always that fear that a stretcher could end up dropping into the sea. Run! 